Nicholas O'Leary, welcome to the Undraped Artist Podcast. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's good to have you. So by your accent, it sounds like you're from, forgive me, I'm really bad with accents, but somewhere in Great Britain. Almost. Almost? Where are you? Um, we speak the same language, New Zealand. New Zealand? Oh, man, I was way off. <laughs> Okay, well, you know, yeah, I'm, I've never been good at accents, <laughs> although you did only say a couple words, so to my defense. Were you born and raised in New Zealand? Yeah, yeah, until I was 22, I lived in New Zealand. Okay, so you're the second artist I've had from New Zealand. I interviewed Andrew Tischler some time ago. Do you, by any chance, oh, cross yeah. paths with him ever? I mean, I know it's probably a pretty big place, but... Nah, but I've got... Um... I have a friend that I was, I've been painting with plain air in New Zealand a bit, and he's my best buds with Andrew. Oh, no kidding. So he always talks, he always talks about him. Okay. <laughs> but he's in the, he's in the, he's in the other island. There's two islands. Oh, there are. Okay. I didn't even realize that. Yeah. My geography and accents, that's all bad. It's all bad. But well, it's great to meet you and it's great to have you on the podcast. So I'm really excited. First of all, I got to tell you, your work is phenomenal. I mean, of course, that's why I invited you on the podcast. Not only is it good, but it's really different. It seems hard as a landscape painter to look different. And there's just so much out there. I want to talk about this as we get further in the podcast, but you seem to have got kind of a signature way of making marks and shapes that's really all your own. And uh, I'm really curious how you came upon that. But before we talk about that, I just want to get a little bit of history on you. So where, I mean, we know you're from New Zealand, but tell me a little bit about your childhood and, and how you got into art. Yeah. So I was, I was born, I like was raised in this, um, a town with 30,000 people. I think we lived at a, at a surfing beach, my parents across the road from a surfing beach. Um, so it was a bit, it was kind of rural. The area was kind of rural. So it has, I mean, I guess you could say it has lots of nature, but it's, um, it's very different to the nature I experienced today in Norway. And then, um, I just, I just, we were just into art as kids. I don't really know. It's not like we were, it's not like my parents were artists or anything, but they were both, both very, makers if that's a proper term what do you mean like they both like they both make things like my mum has a crafts club okay she also thinks if new zealand had a show called so you think you could sew like if you so you think you could cook mm -hmm. or so you think you could dance she thinks if there's a sewing one that she would win <laughs> so she must be pretty good at sewing <laughs> your mom sounds funny <laughs> uh, and then we were I, th I think when i was at primary school it was I mean, I probably wasn't the best in my class, but we were okay at drawing then. My dad had shown me how to draw a tank in perspective. So mm -hmm. I just <laughs> remembered that and I always just drew tanks in perspective. <laughs> then I drew big monster, monster trucks in perspective, MIG planes in perspective. There was another kid who could draw T-Rexes though, and I tried and they, they were much harder. So he was... <laughs> It's cracking me up. Phrase, phrase or something. He was much better. That's funny. When I but was then, a kid, um, my dad taught me how to do uh, this old car from like the early 1900s, this this old car, and, and how to draw airplanes. As dads do that. They show their kids how to draw a few cool things, yeah. and then the kid just run with it, runs with it. But cur curvy stuff like an old car would be much more difficult than... No, no. It was very two-dimensional. It was... Yeah, I don't even know the car. I'm not a car guy, but it was easy. It was quite easy, believe me. Nice. Yeah. And then the high, I, I think I really, and then at, and at middle school, our middle school, which is like between when you're 10 and 12, I don't feel like we really did anything at that school. We didn't really, I don't think we learned anything. I, I think, I mean, like we learned times tables before we went there. And then at this school, it seemed like it was just 
but about having fun. That was their motto. You mean education in general it. or art? Yeah, no, education in general. But that's what? where I sort of started. They had oil paints in that school. Really? Um, their motto was, we're not here for a long time. We're here for a good time. You're there for two years. Really? Everyone passes. Yeah. <laughs> wow. That's different. And then I remember I didn't get my family still, everyone in my family remembers this, but I didn't get into the art. You could, you could choose like an election on Fridays and I wanted to do art, but I didn't get into it. So I did skateboarding instead, which was, I like, I was into skateboarding, so that was fine, but I was always really bitter that I didn't get into art. And then, um, at high school, I'd say that's when I really started getting into it a lot more, maybe not in a traditional sense. We didn't have that much. We probably still don't have that much like paint paintings in New Zealand that are like European master sort of paintings. Right. If any. Right. Maybe there's one guy who um, did a few, uh, like an old portrait painter, but um, not really much to say. So it, was, it wasn't so influenced by anything like that. It was more influenced by like the Banksy book came out at that time. So everyone got really into doing stencils. <laughs> and so how old are you? It was free. You know? I mean, where was the, what, what stage is the internet at when you're in high school? Oh, no internet. Oh, maybe, maybe there was internet, but we didn't have okay. it or know how to use so it. So you really didn't have exposure really at all, except for maybe books or something. Well, I actually think I have a theory that that when I was young, like when I was at high school, I actually, I thought I was really good at art. Even when I was at middle school and I didn't get into this art extension, I thought I was really good. Mm -hmm. And and looking back, that's because I just hadn't seen anything mm -hmm. that was good. Like I literally had never seen, I, I thought I was just the man because I could do bubble writing mm -hmm. or block writing. But, but, but so I, I have a feeling that that sort of made me like it a bit more that I thought I was good at it. Hmm. That makes sense. You like doing so, what you're yeah, good at. I'd, yeah. Like everyone else probably hadn't seen anything better as well. And you'd get lots of compliments and, um, yeah. So when did you discover you that you weren't find, good? <laughs> I guess once you discover, once you discover everyone else, you, f you realize you aren't good. <laughs> More. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And when did that happen though? It was that, did you go to college? Is it, some point you went to a library um, and saw good work. I mean, wh when did that happen? The, the first one who was a real influence on me was I, um, I couldn't fit art into my normal schedule at high school. So they put me in with the guys, these two other guys that were a year ahead of me. Mm -hmm. And it was just three of three of us in this class. And it, which is weird because it was a massive school with 500 people, every, every age group. So there was just the three of us, which was this weird, quiet time twice mm -hmm. a week. And one of those other guys who was a year above me, he was like my hero. He was really good at painting. Um, so he kind of, since there was only three of us and he probably, I don't know, he didn't sit, nobody seemed to bully me, even though I was a year under them. Um, he really helped me out and like, uh, showed me some stuff. And that was just a, and then I would also go in at lunchtime if it was raining or something like this. And that's where everyone would hang out. Just, as I said, we had those Banksy books and we had unlimited paint and brushes at that school for free. So everyone would just hang out in there and make stuff. The kids who were doing graffiti would practice their graffiti tags in there. Really? Even ask for, even ask for critiques and stuff from me. <laughs> it's quite cool. That's so wild. <laughs> So it was just a free for all. They didn't have any teachers in there directing the activity. There was, I mean, there was meant to be a teacher, but he, since there was just three of us, I don't think he thought saw it as so important. Our little class. When you say everyone, I, I imagine more than three people. When you say everyone, you just mean yeah, the three like of you. at lunchtime. No, at lunchtime it would just at, at lunchtime. Like so, we would go in during normal class hours, and then at lunchtime, if it was raining, then sort of my group of friends would come in and the. The other guys groups of friends would come in okay and it would just sort of be a 
so you don't have to stand outside in the rain. Okay. We had gotcha. the secret spot that had nobody in it really. <laughs> oh, well, that had that had space and something to do. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay, so I'm curious what this other guy ended up doing. Did he become an artist? He's an I'm pretty sure he's an architect. No kidding. And you became the artist. How interesting is that? It yeah, worked out that way. In a roundabout way. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so then what happened after high school? Um, well, then, then I went to architecture school, actually. I followed the other <laughs> guy, of course. You guys are like, <laughs> yeah, really, really mixing it up there. I, ha I have my role model, like, down packed. Yeah. yeah. And then um, um, I just kept painting, actually. While you were in architecture uh, school? Yeah, well, I had to work in architecture school. So probably like three days a week, I'd have to work. And then after one year, and then and then through the summer vacations as well, I'd have to always work on lots of different jobs. Hmm. And then one year was I was doing checkout at a at Kmart. If you have Kmart over there, yeah, we do. And that I hated that. I just hated checkout. That for me that was torture. So even other jobs I'd had like I'd have been a commercial fisherman, which everyone says that's a hard job. That was really fun, but checkout was just uh, then. Then I started my, I had a big plan that I was going to stop doing checkout and start trying to sell some paintings at like a cafe or something. And that kind of worked. So I got Atticus, my dog is like, but yeah, that kind of worked. So then that, that was sort of a way that it sort of kicked a bit into gear and I could afford some paints and, um, and time to sort of start painting. Hmm. So you really didn't, other than your friend in high school, you really didn't have any painting training. You just kind of went for it on your own. Actually, no, no, actually I forgot one part then. Then at, when I was 19 or 18, when I was 18, um, my mum, I think I just started painting again now. And my mum for my Christmas present got me a workshop with this um, this New Zealand artist. And I was furious about, basically that meant I had to go back to school during the vacation. But just I for a was, week? Was it a week long workshop or something more involved? I think it was like two, day, two days maybe. It may have been a week, but I have a feeling it was two days because we did two paintings that I remember vividly. Um, and then, but then, so I was, I was furious at her for this. And then I went and I absolutely loved it. He showed me, this was the first time anyone showed me any sort of technical things at all that you could like sketch in with thin paint and then put thick paint over it or how to wash your brushes or anything really. Hmm. So that was, a uh, yeah. Then after that, I was, I was away by myself. Um, yeah, wow. I was into it after that, for sure. Yeah, it's interesting how the most uh, simple things, like laying in a drawing with thin paint and then painting thick over it, can be such a game changer. I was just talking to one of my students yesterday as I was painting, and and I was using this, and I'm I, I, my paintings compared to some people are you know not as tight as some. And I try and get some impasto and some interesting brushwork, but I was using this tiny little rigger brush in this one little area. And she's like, you can use little brushes like that. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and then she goes, see, just seeing stuff like that makes all the difference. Cause I thought by looking at your paintings, it was all done with bigger brushes. I'm like, well, you can't do everything with big brushes. But I remember having the same feeling as a young artist by looking at other people's paintings, look at all these big brush marks. Maybe you, they don't use small brushes, but to see another artist do it is totally a game changer. To see something as simple as lay it in thin and then paint on top of it thicker. Yeah. And also he like, was the first time I'd seen someone like cut around shapes, you know, so that you could paint with a thick brush and then make it thinner mm -hmm. by cutting around it which I'd never sort of before that I'd just put the brush stroke where I thought the brush stroke should go. 
So only one workshop for a couple days. Yeah. And then I did another one maybe two years later at the same, it was like a local community college that in my hometown that was uh, hosting the first workshop. And then they hosted the second one a few years later. And my mum bought me that as well. And he was a, uh, we did in that, we did a figure painting, although I doubt we had a model, although I could, maybe we did have a model, but um, I, I would doubt it because I, I would have remembered having a naked man in front of me because I had a picture of an old man, naked man. And then we'd done that just, we, he taught us to use complementary colors. So mine was with red shadows and green highlights. Hmm. And um, I think that stuck with me as well. That complementary lesson that you could achieve so much by it. And then those were the only two. Yeah, that was all the workshops I've done. So I don't normally ask this question, though. With you, I feel like I need to. Then who are your influences? Where, what were you looking at to evolve as an artist? I mean, I wasn't, I don't even know if I was looking to evolve as an artist. Uh, up to, I, I, I went to the Odd Nerdrum, Odd Nerdrum, mm -hmm. as you might say, when I was um, maybe like 25 or something or 26 for six weeks. Okay. But up until then, I'd seen one of his paintings. That was the first time I'd been like really struck by how well painted it was. And up until then, I, I don't know, I just sort of blew in the wind. I just paint what I wanted to paint. And I think I had my own little, in terms of progression, it would be my own little technical challenges. Like you could maybe equate it to playing a computer game or something. Like I'd figure out how to do one thing and then figure out how I could do it better and just keep moving up. And uh, you probably remember as well. It wasn't like stuff was on YouTube back then. No. Well, I mean, I don't know when. So when? Let's put this in perspective. When like were you born? In, I'm curious when you were born. 1986. 1986. Okay. So the internet, you had it, but it wasn't. It was in its infancy. I mean, you didn't have the videos available that people have now. Nah. I mean, I didn't even have a computer. I didn't have my own computer till I was twenty. One, maybe. I mean, we had computers at school, but it wasn't like you'd sit down and surf the web. Right, right. That surprises me because cause I'm about 12 years older than you. I was born in 74. Although I was late to school, I, I got back to school at 23. So that put me about seven years ahead of you. And uh, we had computers and Photoshop and everything. I wonder if it's just the difference between America and New Zealand or, or just the school you the environment you were growing up in. There was no YouTube and social media and all that kind of stuff, but. There, there could have easily been, it, it was probably just my group of friends. It wasn't, it just wasn't a thing we did. Yeah. I'm sure some people were computering. And there was one guy who was playing like this online game. He was always trying to get me to join. But for us, you're like, it would have meant I'd have to go to like a computer lab and use a computer. Right. It wasn't, right. it just wasn't something that I did. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. So how did you end up with Odd Neardrum? My, so the, I'd moved to Norway by the stage and one of my colleagues, sisters had studied with him. And then I'd seen his work in this, um, in this magazine that came with the newspaper. That's sort of the whole, it's like the newspaper the whole country would get. And then, um, and then I saw that he had some in Bergen as well, some paintings. And I saw those paintings and then I'd, I'd never heard of him before, before this, this time, as I say, I hadn't really been actively seeking out to look at other painters. Really. I'd just been doing my own thing. And, um, when I saw his, I was, yeah, I was like, uh, yeah, wow, this guy can really paint. So I just wrote a letter to him. And, she, and, and my colleague sister had told me that she, um, yeah, she'd stayed with him for so-and-so amount of time. But yeah, you can just write to him and see what he says. So I did that. And, uh, 
they invited me over to their farm sort of thing with a big with some big barns that have been converted into studios and I stayed there for six weeks during the winter with a few other students and then you could sort of just watch him paint and yeah pick up on what it's not a school per se like I don't know if you'd give you any tips in terms of technical painting things but you could watch him paint which is a lot if you're observant yeah that's worth its weight in gold just to sit and watch a master like Odnerdrum. now were you with anyone that we would know when you were there during your six weeks um because I've interviewed a few other people that studied with him, Alex Venezia, Teresa Oaxaca, for example. I know of them, but yeah, I haven't met them. They weren't there at the same time. Okay. So what did nah, you do? Did he me, just give you free room and board and you just wandered around the farm? I mean, you must have done something else besides sit and watch. Oh, no, paint. we painted. We painted. Okay. We painted. So we had our own little, like, student studio. And... um and we'd paint all the time. Like it was almost like this. We worked really hard. We worked the whole time. Painting. But he didn't give you assignments or anything. He just stuck you in the studio and said, go ahead and paint. And you can watch me if you want. He, he said, he said like it was kind of an understanding. I don't know if he said it, but lots of the information would come to me sort of secondhand from the students who had been there longer than me or someone in his family or something that we were meant to do a self portrait and then leave it there for, for him. Mm. So everyone was working on their self portrait most of the time. There were some students that of course been there for, for ages, like, like 10 years or more. Really? Yeah. So they does he just have walls full of self portraits? Cause I know a lot of people have gone there. It wasn't, I don't, I don't know where they all are. I don't know where the <laughs> self portraits are. There was sort of a bunch around, but there wasn't hundreds. Huh. Yeah, I wonder what Unless kind of collection stacked, he's got. Stacked in the stacked behind easels or something. So is that all you did then? Was just the self portrait? Oh no, I did I didn't I remember what I did. I did one self portrait, trying to like emulate some of the thing way he painted. That was a failure. I just like I think it was too um I just tried too hard. There was too much paint on there, but on the end. And then, so I just, I don't like giving up on stuff. So I struggled with this for like, how long was I there? Six weeks, did I say? I struggled with that probably for four weeks. In the end, I just threw that out. Mm. And then I started again. And I think that four weeks of struggle had, had honed me quite a bit in the terms of doing a self portrait. Cause it was hard from a mirror the first time if you've tried mm -hmm. that like every way you move is a, every time you <laughs> do a brush stroke, then you look back up and then you have to move your head back into the position you were. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So then the next one I did, then I was happy with that. And then that only took a few days maybe. And then I did another one and another one. So in the last two weeks, I think I did three or four. Wow. Yeah, that's quite an improvement was, from was the quite first four it. weeks. Yeah, but that was torturous. Not like I hate just giving up on something like that. I don't have many paintings that I give up on. Hmm. I probably still have it in my basement somewhere that I don't. I don't want to throw it out because. But then every time I look at it, it's just painful. Really. Yeah, but you said you had to leave Painfully one behind. Irritating. Did, did he just pick his favorite? Yeah, that's the that's the gift for him. I think I could choose which one I'd give to him. Um. I probably left my best one, I imagine, or what I thought was my best one. Right. And that is Chunky. what he gets for the kindness of letting you live with him for free and watch him paint for six weeks as a self-portrait. I assume so, but I mean, uh, he, he was a, yeah, he was, they were, it was a really nice, um, incredibly nice uh, environment there. Yeah, it sounds amazing. All the students are really like, um, yeah, super cool. Yeah. All right. So was that the last experience you had with training before you totally went off on your own and did your own thing? Yeah. yeah. 
Okay. Well, you paint nothing like Odd Nerdrum. So I want to talk about that. How did you settle on what you're doing now? I'm going to pull up some of your work here on your website. Here's, here's my observation of your work in, in that what makes it unique is that you managed to create this really high level of realism, but then when you really look closely at it, it's very graphic and very design oriented. I mean, you've got lots and lots of flat shapes, like with this landscape through here, the way yeah. you've simplified all of these branches into one cool color in almost a web design in the background. But, it, but when you step back from it, it looks like absolute naturalism. So I'm curious how you, you know, how you arrived at this? What was, did you always paint this way? Is this just the way it comes out of you? Is it something that you've um, evolved? into over time it's just it's just the way the evolution has gone i don't know if i've well it's not like i painted like that at the start and we definitely didn't paint like that with odd and um i know that before i went to odd i was painting from photos and references i tried a few things from life but then when odd was doing everything from life and i could see that he could get so much more uh, from life and imagination than he could. Well, I mean, I didn't see him try a photo. I doubt he does, but just to see how much he could get out of these like subtleties and um, your ability to understand a subject and move stuff around. So then I tried to paint some landscapes outside. Because a few people would try, I'd seen a few other students that were there before me. There were some like landscapes lying around that were painted outside. I thought, oh, when I get back home, I'll try, I'll try and paint some painting outside. And then I tried it, and it was really hard. That and that annoyed me. That really pissed me off, actually, that it was so hard. <laughs> yes, so it then, is. So then I was, then I was off on it. That that was my that that was my obsession. Tell me about that. What did you do to gain control of that process? Because. If you've listened to some of the podcasts, which you said you have, whenever I talk to a landscape painter, I, I say the same thing. It's, you know, I'm trying to figure this plain air painting thing out and, uh, chasing the light and whatnot is just so frustrating. What have you, yeah. what have you learned in this process? It's made you able to f create these successful pieces. Apart from the obvious is that you get very fast you're forced to be quite fast it, the whole the whole time i've been doing this because i was annoyed that it was so difficult so after every time i'd fail it would get a bit better but i would be very actively finding out what i'd done wrong like where what had been the problem that had caused this painting to be a failure had i been too slow had i not foreseen that the sun will move 10 degrees in the course of the painting when it went cloudy halfway, should have I stuck with the sunny or should have I switched over to cloudy? If it's raining, should I give up or can an umbrella work? Just all these little things, which would always seem like something. It would seem like almost every single time there'd be something that would happen. Or that like if it's overcast and the sky's all dirty, you're like, okay, I have to be much more careful with putting white in if it's wet paint. Yeah. So it was just a, dissecting and critiquing myself just because I was irritated that it was difficult mostly. Okay. So, you... and then it was also like, but also like the comp after a while, you realize the composition, you, you talked a bit about that, that the composition and design, like after you do like a few that are unsavable because the composition sucks, then you realize you have to start really paying attention to that. How much mm -hmm. can you get away with relying purely on composition? Which, and, and, and for me, that's like, it is almost one of the hardest parts. It's like the soul of the painting in a way. So I, I feel like 
once I've got more and more into like realizing that composition was a very important element and could make or break a painting, then I got so much, I, I got really into this, the design of the paintings. And so then this painting, for example, like I felt like I'd worked out a good composition and like you could go, if you wanted to, for example, go all the way and paint it like a photo, like I know that it would work. So I'm not, I wouldn't be, I, I, I wouldn't impress myself by doing that because I, it wouldn't be a surprise if, uh, I wouldn't, like I know that I could make it into a, a photorealistic painting if I took the time to do it. Right. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. So it's not really a challenge. So I wouldn't, I don't need to go that far. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. 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 It's funny you should say that because I was just looking at on social media, photorealism is just eye candy. People just seem to s soak it up. And frankly, as a, you know, a painter of 20 years, I would assume you would agree with this. Correct me if, if you don't, but it's interesting how people don't realize that getting to that level of detail is just a matter of time. It's not, it's not anything more. It's just putting in a lot of time and tediously working every little centimeter of that painting to death. Once you get to the point that you're at here, most of the real difficult problems have already been solved. To get it to a level of photorealism, it's just a matter of a lot more time. Yeah, you just, then you're just trading your tears for likes at that point. That, that's a good way of putting it. I'd say. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I just have to take a minute to thank each one of my generous patrons for your part in keeping this podcast going. I could not continue to do it without you, so thank you so much. If you're not a patron yet, but you love the show and you listen regularly, please consider becoming a patron. It's really easy to do, and it doesn't have to break the bank. Just head over to theundrapedartist.com and click on the link, Be My Patron on Podbean. And then choose a monthly donation amount that fits your budget. It's that simple. And to thank you for your generous donations, once you've reached $100 in total contributions, send me an email to theundrapedartist at gmail.com and I will send you one of our spectacular undraped artist aprons. Okay, here's another one with the mountains. And there again, I, I just love, I don't know if graphic is the right word, but the, I love the way you simplify these rocks into these beautiful flat shapes of color. It's, I just, and you know, maybe what it is, is uh, you really have a lot of hard edges too, which I think is, is maybe what I'm looking at. Maybe the thing that's making your paintings look a little bit different than others that I've seen. Yeah. Is, yeah. is that an intentional that. thing? Is that, am I wrong about that? No, you're right, but I didn't notice it until I think it was like 2019 and at Plania Eastern, they had like a little summer camp and the kids asked me, they put up their hand and I had to say yes while I was painting. And then the teacher said, you can ask him. And she goes, why don't you have any hard, uh, why don't you have any soft edges? <laughs> and I'd never, th I'd never thought about it until that stage. <laughs> yeah, but now, okay. So how old is this painting? Are you still hanging on to that despite that no, question? No, this is, this was just last year. Okay. So you're still doing it. So, um, so this is, this is a personal taste decision for you then. And saying that, but I do it my own way. I do it with, um, like you could smudge it in, but I often do it with like hitting back the colors where I don't want it to um, provide a strong contrast. What do you mean by that? Hitting back the colors, just making them less chromatic. Yeah. Like in the foreground, for example, there's no like sharp bits of white highlight as a, like a, an obvious example compared to that background mountain. If we want to look at that, at the, if we, we like, as a focal point, we don't really want to get our eye to get stuck on the foreground chunk of rocks. So what you're saying is because edges make your eye want to move to it, hard edges will make you move your eye. You want to keep the hard edges. So you're reducing the contrast 
in order to keep your eye away from it. Yeah. Okay. That's usually what I tend. I mean, in portraits, I I would do it with like normal lost and found edges. Okay, let's look at but your portraits. Often I like the, some. Okay, it's going to take me. You just oh, click on the white. We did it again. Okay, let's see. Yeah, <laughs> is this self-portrait? Or like that, like that lady down to the right there that would have. Okay. Lots of like normal lost and found edges. Yeah, it does. It does, but it's still down here in the shirt. There's still this hard edged kind of graphic quality to it. And even yeah. in the hair, yeah. even in the you hair. Mean. Yeah, you're like these shapes are broken up into hard shapes, hard edged shapes. Like this one right through here. Fine, you're right. You're right. <laughs> it's graphical. Don't feel bad about it. I love it. It's great. It's great. But I do but I do like you see like for example that line around the shadow on the um like the sternum there under the Yeah, collar. right here. Yeah. Like I, I it's almost like or at least where I am now, it's almost like I feel like how you doodle when you're drawing when you're on the phone. Yeah. Like this. I just want to like doodle all over it. And these little things I like just they feel right somehow. But I don't I can't explain why. It's just like that same style as I doodle. I'd like draw around text. Man, I draw all these like rings around it. That's interesting you would put it that way. Because I I need to I need to find the author for this book. But many years ago when I first opened my atelier, I had a student who told me or brought in a book in the book. It talked about how everyone has their own personal aesthetic, just innately. That's innately theirs. The way they tested that was this person put a bunch of people in a room and then gave them a piece of paper and told them that they were going to be asked a bunch of questions and write their answers on the paper. And then the person running the test left the room and said they'd be right back, but they didn't come back for, I don't know, an hour, a half an hour, a, a long time. They didn't come back. So you can imagine what people do with a pencil and a blank piece of paper when they're sitting there for an hour waiting for a test, they start doodling on it. And she repeated this thing over and over and over again and got, I don't know how many, probably hundreds of examples of doodles. And they were all different. And, and what she, the argument she made with that is that we do have a personal aesthetic. And I often talk about our personal style as being our mannerisms or our, our, um, just our personal tendencies, just the way we move. And, and I think that that's captured in doodles. And so you would yeah. see, you would see some people have these serpentine little curly Q lines, and then you'd have someone creating a bunch of blocks and then someone drawing kind of a maze shape. And then it was just really fascinating. And so when you describe your paintings as, yeah, this is, I just kind of want to paint the way I would doodle on the phone based on this experiment or what she found in this, or believe she found in this experiment, that, that is arguably the most authentic way to paint because that's the way you naturally make marks. Yeah. I mean, I wish she would have asked some like very well thought out questions on that, on that bit of paper as well. So I could try and correlate it. What do you mean? I, because I, I'd heard this room. I don't know if it was a, I'd heard someone had told me, so I don't know if it's a true fact or not, but they said that if you doodle with straight lines, it means you're very like direction orientated, like you'll get things achieved in your life. Okay. And the opposite, if you draw in curly, in curly lines. Oh, so that I can't switched. be true. I was just, I switched, I switched my doodling style. I was like, always oh, just trying to draw like the straightest line you could draw. <laughs> I'll be a winner if I make like, straight lines. In the last lines. five years, I've reverted back to like just like pure curves. See, you can't do it. So if this is true. For, for five years. Uh, yeah. yeah, you can make yourself do it. I mean, think about it. Think about all the ateliers out there that are creating clones, right? 
And so this this is yeah. this is what's interesting. What I found most interesting about this experiment, and what how I've applied it in my personal teaching, that if it's if if her conclusions are accurate, then we are all born with a personal aesthetic, a way of moving, just like we have a way of walking, just like just just like any other mannerism. And as a, and as a teacher. I personally believe that it's important to not take that from a student, to not teach it away from them, to not tell them, no, make lines like this, make strokes like this, do it the way I do it as the teacher, because it's the right way, but instead to teach principles so that they can apply their own mannerisms to the painting and, and just yeah. use the principles. So you've kind of proven that because you can will it away. You can paint straight lines. It's not like you're incapable of painting straight lines, <laughs> but you're just not comfortable with it. You don't want to do it. So over five year period, you went back to what, sh what your true tendencies are, you could argue. But you know, if you run a hundred people through certain ateliers, they're all going to paint the same. And some of them will believe in their minds intellectually that that's the right way to paint and they will hang on to that for a career and for their entire lives because that's the right way to paint and they will have abandoned their mannerisms others will go back to their their own personal mannerisms and aesthetics it's hard to say yeah but i, I was gonna say i'd like i felt like the last time i was in new zealand last uh, christmas my nieces who were sort of between the ages of three and six, maybe there's four of them. They all do lots of drawing. So when I come there, it's like, they're like, uncle Nick, draw with us, draw with us. You're really good at drawing. So just drawing the whole time and often doing those games where you fold a piece of paper into four bits and someone draws the head. Mm -hmm. They were really good, just insanely creative. And, and since like one of them's three, and she was doing these really good drawings. Maybe she like didn't have much control over where <laughs> her hand went, but you could see that they were good ideas. Mm -hmm. Like I had one which was like a unicorn stabbing a man, holding a newspaper with a briefcase. And it was like, and I was thinking, I asked my mother, I said, that, that's, so basically I've only been in control of a pen for two years. If I give them two more years, they'll be better than me. And I felt a bit, <laughs> like a, a bit stupid that it was, I was like almost jealous of them that they were so good so young and my mother said oh once they go to school they'll lose it all oh gosh once they once they learn how to draw a stick person they don't draw people like stick people they draw people with humongous fat octopus arms and then they don't draw a house or a tree like a tree that or a house like a house it would just be the way they've figured out how to do it themselves and so you, Jeff, for your atelier, if you want to prove it, you need to get them young. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I you got to go out scout. You got to go out scouting. <laughs> get them at three years old and see if you can preserve that. So what would what are you suggesting, or what is your mother suggesting that? What would you be preserving if you could avoid contaminating their creativity, so to speak? I don't think the conversation went any further. I was just relieved that they wouldn't be better than me in two years. And I'd pres <laughs> preserve my uh, superiority. <laughs> That's hilarious. But I, I did try to um, harness it. So I got I, I got all of them and I was like, okay, I've got a big canvas here and everyone's going to help me paint it. And I'm just going to like curate this into like a, a masterpiece of all their all their creativity. But then they were quite hard to control. They didn't want anyone to draw anywhere near their drawings if they'd done a little bit. But I did uh, uh, so much potential. You don't believe that they shouldn't learn anything, right? I mean, you're not suggesting that they've already got what they need to be great artists. So just leave it alone. Or are you? No, I'm not suggesting that. So what is it you think um, needs to be preserved? It was their way that they'd figured out how to do stuff a completely different way. The fact that 
you ask a, the three yard to draw a person and they don't draw a stick person, but you ask someone between the age of five and 15, probably they'll just draw a stick person. Or even between the age of five and 90, they'll probably draw a stick person. Because someone taught them how to draw a stick person. But before that, they're actually trying to I, interpret I the so. world in their own way. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. That would be an interesting I mean, I experiment. Think, I didn't think any deeper about it. I just, uh, it was an observation and I, and I like, I have lots of their drawings. I, every time my sister sends me a picture of it on Snapchat, I tell her which ones I want, and then she sends them over to me. So I have a really? bunch of them. Huh. And then I've, but I've tried myself to emulate it. Like I realize, okay, I'm too good at drawing with my right hand. I obviously have too much control and those girls have no control. So I'd switch, now I switched to my left hand like a few years ago. And then I got a bit too good with my left hand. So then you have to switch to holding the pen like, uh, where's my camera? Like this. Mm-hmm. So you're just like really like losing control and then you have to do it without looking at the paper. And I, li I liked them more always at the start when I'd start the less controlled way of doing it. I'd always like it more that it was, I don't know, felt a bit more. But less control unre unrehearsed. But what do motor skills have to do with creativity though? I mean, it's not the same thing. No. So you're suggesting that by it was just to emulate some skills, of the okay. No, it wasn't to increase creativity. It was just more to emulate something of I, I couldn't compete with the creativity. Of yeah. This. Yeah, because you're not the first like one a, to do that. A randomness. Obviously, you're not the first one no. to do that. I mean, I use a I use certain brushes, like a big old fan brush, to reduce control so that I'm not constantly picking away at paintings. You know, I interviewed Aaliyah Chapin, who paints with her left hand sometimes in order to paint more like a child. I mean, a lot of us have done that. But like I said, I mean, the, the question I have is how, well, I guess I don't know the question. What is it about our personal aesthetic, though? The, 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 it's one thing to have poor motor control that makes our drawings kind of interesting but that's that's uh sort of the same thing as as in the the what's interesting about nature the randomness of nature you know you walk out and you see that the branches just randomly grew this way and it creates this kind of cool pattern but it's totally random there's no consciousness behind it and you could almost equate that to the beautiful drawing of a child because of poor motor skills it's not like the child Hat, not like the child did it on purpose. It's a, it's a, it's a product of almost yeah. random movement, right? So, but as far as, uh, but it's yeah, it's also like the drawing with your right hand. You're very rehearsed. I'm very rehearsed in the way I would turn a brush to the right, right, or that I would paint a branch or a limb. I mean, particularly with like a human figure. Like I know, I know already how I paint knees. Okay. Like I can almost like just go straight through it, but um, so well, you can't do it that way anymore. So you're trying to avoid formulas. Yeah, and I like it's nice to be surprised. Yeah, yeah. But what about back to the curly lines or the curves that you couldn't avoid after five years of trying? to see yourself as a go-getter who makes straight lines. <laughs> that's the thing though. That's the thing that children have that we have, I believe, and this author believes have from birth that has nothing to do with coordination. It just has to do with our own tendencies toward a particular aesthetic or even just the way we naturally move coordinated or not. Perhaps I don't. It could be just that's the way your parents draw. I don't know. I, I haven't read the book. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I don't know <laughs> she, if she, she has, so. she has sure the she answers. I don't think them, she but... has the answers either. I think her, the, I really need to get this book, but uh, I remember the author. I think uh, if I remember right, it, the, the goal of 
the book for her was just to make the point that they have it, not where it comes from, uh, you, you know, yeah. not if it comes from parents or whatever, but but just the fact that there is a difference, that there is an innate difference from one person to another. And uh, when I see artists like yourself, it's obvious that there's something there that separates you. And it, and I f I'm more convinced than ever because of what you had said about, yeah, I wanted to be a different artist. I wanted to paint with straight lines because someone told me that. <laughs> it really cracks me up. Someone told me that. What did you say that they said? It would it makes you more of a go getter, or it makes you more of a. Yeah, it's like you have direction in your life. Like you have you direction. Achieve, yeah. You set and achieve goals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I I think it's great that you went five whole years trying to be a goal setter, but but you couldn't. You just had to go back to the to the curves. <laughs> But I don't set and achieve goals either. So you don't? I right. don't know. I don't know if that's true. I, I, I'm a little skeptical of that conclusion because I've had, I've had a similar experience in my own work where I want to paint like other people and I just, I can paint like other people. I can totally do it. I could mimic almost anybody, but then I always end up going back to the same decisions that I'm comfortable with. Even though I'm capable of mimicking another artist, yeah, you know, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't feel natural. It's that that I'm talking about, and it seems like you've discovered that too, because you keep coming back to these hard-edged, relatively hard-edged. You do obviously have soft edges in your paintings, but relatively hard-edged, sort of graphic, sort of curve, curvilinear lines. Um, the things that make your paintings your paintings. I mean, the hard, the hard edge thing as well is like, I use really smooth canvas. Like I, I, I want to see my brush work. Like I really don't. No, 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 that's you not probably, it. You'll probably find that's examples, but I really look don't at, like, look at this. Yeah. Look at this. You're like literally illustrating oh, a cloud. It. Yeah. No, this is, this, <laughs> this is, <laughs> it's not, I feel like I'm, I feel like I've got you on a couch and I'm telling you how you are. Yeah, you're educating me about <laughs> about myself. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Just tell me to stop. No, but No, I, you can I, you can train the AI the AI bot for <laughs> Nicholas O'Leary style. <laughs> but look at this water. Come on. That from a distance looks like water, but it's not water at all. It's a graphic interpretation of water. It's it's an illustration of water in a way. And it's clearly you doodling as though you were by the phone. I mean, you just said it. Yeah. That shape will just be because I like the shape. It exactly. Would, it's not like the wind would, would have stayed still. No, you like the shape, but not just the shape because, you know, there are other painters like, uh, you know, well, any other landscape painter that I've talked to, you say Brian Mark Taylor, Brian Mark Taylor is a real stickler about design. He'll move things around all the time. Whereas, uh, Patrick Okrasinski just paints what he sees and he'll find the right place and, and nature's good enough. But Brian Mark Taylor would say, move everything around so you get the right shapes. But then he generally wouldn't make those shapes look graphic like this. Yeah. Right. That is, that's something that obviously appeals to you. That is you, that I think is unique to you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I feel like I'm surprising you. Sounds like true. You've never noticed, sounds true. Like you've never noticed your own work. <laughs> this is gorgeous. So these, so is everything you do from plain air or from life, or do you yeah, ever work from last, photos? Yeah. Um, I did one commission like two years ago from a photo. Okay. And I didn't like. I, I didn't. I actually that was torturous. I, I really didn't like it. What it about? Like, I mean, of course, there was like I had to put lots of bits of photo together and make a composition and stuff, but it did feel like I was just a human printer. I yeah. felt a low page human printer. Like I, I could just do something else. <laughs> just because it was as though the photograph is already there. What's the point? Is that? Yeah, but I could just feed it into like some upscaling program in a like I did an okay like it was a nice everything was nice but I just did feel like it took me much longer than everything else 
I didn't feel surprised. Like I'd sort of worked stuff out beforehand. Mm-hmm. So there was no joy in the chase anymore. Like for me to doing the actual painting itself, like I knew I was going to be able to do it. It wasn't even a, it was just that I had to do it. So I, it didn't seem very fun. Right. At all. Yeah. Working. It just seemed like life. a chore, a chore to get through. Working from life is definitely Whereas, more fun. Especially like it's just a surprise. You don't know if it's going to work. And then when stuff happens, you have to figure out how you're going to fix it. Gosh, how did you do this one? This is, this is fleeting light. This is 10, 15 minutes max. Did you go back? No, I did it. Multiple days? Uh, yeah, but I wouldn't have spent, I would have spent like three hours, maybe two or three sessions, I'd say. But then I'd like the bit when the light's hitting that part of the tree, like I make sure I get that part done. And like the stuff that's all down the bottom in the shadow, you can sort of be a bit more lenient when exactly that happens. But this is like the middle of day in, in like the winter in Norway. So I didn't, it wasn't like 15 minutes. I had a long time. Uh, it's probably from like 15 degrees on one side to 15 degrees on the other side. This is the middle of the lit. day. You've got to be kidding. So yeah, that makes sense. Obviously you're that far north. So golden hour is all day long in Norway. <laughs> Well, and this isn't winter, so your golden hour is just like the winter normal sun. That's wild. But it doesn't last for that long. It's just like the middle of the day is the only time it comes up. Right. So it sort of just pops up over a mountain and then... In summer, though, you get the sunset lasts for ages. Lasts for hours. Really? Yeah. When did you go to Norway? Oh, that's where I live now. Sorry. Oh, is that where you are now Should have been. in Norway? Yeah, I've been I've been here for the last since two thousand and nine. Okay, that makes sense because as I'm looking at your landscapes and I'm following on social media, I'm like, that doesn't look like New Zealand, and that ex- and that explains why you're hanging out with a friend of Andrew, but not Andrew. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're hard to get information out of, him. man. <laughs> this episode is brought to in part by rosemary brushes if you're one of my listeners who's a professional artist you're already using rosemary brushes but for the rest of you come on take your work a little more seriously stop buying the other brands it's just not worth it every now and then you may get lucky and buy a good brush from another brand but use the brand that professionals like myself are using go to rosemaryandco.com link in the description or the show notes and get yourself some quality brushes before your next painting wow so i purposely don't look at your websites before the podcast oftentimes because i want to be surprised and uh i am definitely surprised you've got some serious diversity in here lots of different kinds of works but yet there there is there is definitely a cohesive quality to them there's only a few standouts like this one that i wouldn't even have known that was you this one's different yeah that's with the nardum palette i believe i don't think that's actually blue in the sky i'm wondering if it's just black oh it does look blue doesn't it Maybe I put just a tiny bit of blue, but otherwise it's the Pelle's palette. Yeah, but also, also you're, you're not really doing what you do in other landscapes with the more graphic, hard edged quality like you have here. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So it's, it seems like, uh, like you must have come out of his school, just figuring out what you're doing at that point, because this is 2015. So it's right after you left there. Yeah, it wasn't like I was actively figuring it out. I was just doing what I liked. Right. Well, do you think it's some of it is just you're shedding influences? You know, you leave his place and you can't help but to be influenced. And then eventually you shed them and then go back to 
the way you doodle, so to speak. Yeah. And even like just my tastes, I know like I couldn't get a tattoo because my tastes just change. Right. In terms of painting, like visual styles. So uh, I know even artists that I loved when I was younger and then now I just am sick of it. Really? That's <laughs> not even that they've maybe just been painting the whole way. Oh, the same the whole time, but it's hmm. it's either I've I've somehow changed, or that I've seen it too much, or that it doesn't match some part of society. I don't know, but they definitely get switched out a lot. So this one, so it's a hundred centimeters by hundred centimeters. What is that like? Is that like 40 inches by 40, 40 inches? 40? 40 inches. Maybe a bit more than 40, I guess. It's 2.5. Yeah. So, 40. yeah, no, that's actually, 40. Yeah, it's it exactly would be 40. 40 by 40. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's a big painting right there. So that, I'm assuming, was also done on location. Yeah. Yeah, it's a bit, only just fits under those vines, actually, because those vines aren't, like a man can't stand under there. Or a woman. I mean, like, it's like, it's not that high. It's probably up to your sh chest or something, or your shoulders. Wow. So, so I had an so artist. So I sat on this little child's seat. I was going to ask it. you that. Yeah. So I had an artist tell me once to avoid lots of busy details when you're painting something. They said, you know, don't paint inside a forest it's just just too many tree limbs there's too many leaves there's too much stuff and it just makes for a bad painting and i don't agree with that at all because i constantly am seeing paintings like this that are just incredibly detailed but absolutely successful but i'm curious one thing i think he's right about is it is hard to manage all that information do you have techniques for breaking this down and simplifying it when you approach something this complex, particularly from life when, you, again, you're chasing the light and, and dappled light, you're really chasing it, although I imagine you improvise a lot with the dappled light. No. I mean, this, <laughs> the, 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 okay, you then. can try, like, you can pay careful attention, very careful attention to the composition. Mm -hmm. And then um, and the focal point. So that when you do paint in details, you paint them where you need to paint them. So it's not like I'm painting lots of highlights sort of down in that shadowy area of the of the vines where it's sort of deeper in. So if I'm painting like that, and then when I paint that one bunch of kiwi fruit up the the one that's in focus, since the light's moving the whole time, that helps if you just get that done. Once you know where it's going to be and what is happening, it helps if you sort of get that done, done and dusted as much as you need to see the subject because then the light's gone. Right. So it'd be to sort of to have a plan and then paint the bits <laughs> that you need to paint when you need to paint them. I mean, it'd be the same as painting a model, I guess, for you. Like, you know, especially if it's not a professional model, you know that if she sits down one time, try and get the face now rather than expecting to be able to finish it off later. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. But even if you think I'm going to, I wouldn't even expect to finish, if it was a figure painting, I wouldn't even expect to finish the paint, the face after a break because I just feel like they're probably not going to get it the same. Right when I need to paint the details and get them, get them done and get them right. So obviously composition is important and I couldn't agree with you more on that, but composition is very subjective. And when I look at a painting like this and I'm squinting at it, it's also very complex in your case. Can you describe how you see the composition broken down in this painting? I know that's probably a really hard question, but maybe walk me through it a little bit because it's a really complex 
composition. And I imagine walking up into uh, vines like this and being overwhelmed by all the details and not being able to break it down into a simple enough composition to know if it's successful. So I don't really have any of those. I've seen online where people draw like these red diagonals and stuff yeah. through things. Mm -hmm. You've seen that? I don't, yeah, I don't know if you... I don't do that. Is that a... Okay, good. I, 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 I've seen people do it on my images too. And yeah. that definitely wasn't what I was doing. Um, so usually I'd think um, like a, a horizontal and vertical balance to start with. Okay. So like if I hold my finger over the left-hand side of the painting or hold my hand over the left-hand side of the painting. Okay. It would become, it would become unbalanced somehow. Oh yeah, that's right. Okay. So it'd be just to try and get it balanced. I didn't on this one, but often I have too much canvas around the back of my canvas so I can, I can move it if I need to. I can like take all the staples off and move it over if I don't think it's centered right. Oh. So I'd do that. I'd do that usually just in case I'd have an extra six inches tucked around there. Wait a minute, but don't you, don't you have to, did you screw up the corners when you stretched it? Don't you have some weird yeah, but dimple then I in just, the corners? I don't cut the, I don't cut it. I just fold it over. No, I don't, I don't actually staple it back onto the, I don't staple it all properly down. I just have it there. And then once I've finished the paint, painting, I'll staple it down properly. Oh, so you don't fold the corners over nice and tight and clean. You just kind of leave it rough. Yeah. In the corner. Okay. But it's tight. The whole, the whole painting is really tight, but it's not taken care of on the back. Okay. Okay. But then do you gesso around the edges or do you just gesso right to the corner? And then, and then when you move it over, you continue the gesso over. Yeah. I can, t I'd do this second one. Okay. Um, so okay. I just gesso to the edge. I gesso once it's straight, like tight on the stretcher. But okay. then of course you have to sort of work a bit because it forms a sort of like a ridge. Right. On the corner when you fold, I have quite thick canvas. So then, um, you need to like pull that, stretch that little edge out, mm -hmm. out of it, and sand it off. To, often sand off some chunks where it's just gone around the side and prime it again. I've never heard of people doing that before. I've heard of people doing it on panel because then you can just run it through a table saw and crop it yeah. at the end. But I've never heard anyone doing it with a canvas. That's interesting. I mean, you could just have a bigger canvas, but it's it's like, even if I have an idea for a painting, it's not like I do it often, but I just want to have, I want to have the escape door. Right. You want the option. That if I've done the whole thing and I'm like, ugh, I painted it an inch too far over to the left, didn't I? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, not a problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So you had talked about how you want it balanced from left to right. And I'm assuming also top to bottom. Is it you're at, are you yeah. after are you after symmetry or asymmetry? Because asymmetry is often more interesting. And in this painting, you do have some asymmetry. If you cover up the left side, the right side is definitely lighter. Uh, lighter meaning uh, less in less there. I mean, you have that big chunk of sky on the right, which makes the right side visually lighter. And I like that asymmetry about it. I mean, it's not so much symmetry, it's more balance, I'd say, um, what I feel is balanced. And then it's, a, so you have, and then you have focus as well. So the, those kiwi fruit up the top are in the focus. Mm -hmm. And ideally, well, I'm sure people have experimented with this more than me, but ideally you don't want that too close to the edge of the canvas. Mm -hmm. um, unless you're doing another sort of, composition which is like this gesture way of working where it's more about uh purely flow yeah i wonder if you could address that and a little then, bit more what's the difference in your mind between symmetry and balance i have my ideas but i'm curious because if you think about it literally if you have a balance and you have an object on one side an object on the other in order to make it balanced you need those two objects to be symmetrical in their weight they need to be identical 
in weight, right? So there is definitely a relationship between symmetry and balance. But how do you see it yeah. visually being different? I mean, it, I mean, it can also be a fat person on a seesaw and then a little person sitting farther out on the other side of the seesaw. Oh, good analogy. I so much. I don't think it has so much to do with like the plan, the plan drawing of a cathedral symmetry. That's what I think when you say symmetry, I feel like. Exactly the yeah, same like thing a, on a both butterfly. sides. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But which, which does work sometimes like putting something in the middle. I mean, it's better to put something in the middle than just a tiny bit away from the middle. I often think. Right. So if I'm going to put something in the middle, then I'll put it in the middle. So you see symmetry as um, identical on both sides, not I, not necessarily identical, but pretty close to the same thing on both sides, the same composition on both sides and balance as what the same interest level of interest on both sides. It's How so do you it's more balance? like you have. So I also, if you see on the bottom there, there's that, um, like a one point perspective going to the end of the row. Yeah. So I've sort of said that that is a visual anchor, if you like, for the, for that whole area of the painting. If you look down into the bottom, you're going to look down to the end. Yeah. Right here. Yeah. Yeah. With like, since, since so many lines are leading there and then that sort of offsets the weight of those kiwi fruit on the top, right as well, which is sort of. The focus are, point up they're there. actually in the same place opposite each other yeah. yeah so it's like balanced in a way right okay so you got your fat person and your little guy on the end on a longer pole <laughs> it's that <laughs> yeah they're they, they're providing the same visual weight so to speak but not the same thing is that yeah. a, an appropriate distinction yeah. Okay. But you can, but you can, I, I feel like there's so many different ways to achieve the same thing. Uh, I, I honestly like it's, although I'm, I, 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 in this painting, I was thinking that I know that I would have been very, um, scared sitting in there on that baby's chair, making sure I got it right. Mm -hmm. on such a big piece um so i would have been very careful but um often you don't need to often i don't plan so far so much in advance and i'll just i'll just make i'll just make balance as it comes yeah i'll just choose a different i'll just choose a different kiwi fruit to highlight Right. Or instead of making the end at the end of the row, these lines so strong, just blur out the lines and put a large piece of sunlight hitting one of these uh, branches on the bottom, for example. So a lot of artists, myself included, will oftentimes figure out their composition by doing a light and dark pattern sketch. You know, where are the dark lights yeah. or where are the lights? Where are the darks? It does that pattern look good. Other artists will, I don't do this, but other artists will photograph their work in black and white so that the light and dark pattern can be seen and to make sure it's right. But this isn't, you're not necessarily balancing composition only with light and dark pattern. You're balancing, you're making compositional decisions based on points of interest because this point of interest is not so much just a dark shape or a light shape. And this isn't so much just a dark shape or a light shape. This is a point of interest because it's something, you know, the, you know, the viewer is likely to look at, and this is an area, you know, the viewer is likely to look at and you balance those two things. So yeah, you're right. So is that, I mean, I guess why I'm, the reason I point that out is because it's something that I don't think about often enough that there is more to composition than just light and dark pattern. It's also what it's also managing 
the points of interest, that thing that you know human beings are most likely to look at. Is that right? Yeah. 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 I mean, there's, there's like on these things, I'm like flying by the, what do you say, flying by the seat of my, my pants. pants? Yeah. So we me trying, tr just trying to figure out how to like get this whole thing in and make it balanced. And yeah, then, yeah there, there could have been multiple ways to do it. But I, the, the, the light and the dark thing, I don't, I actually don't think that that would work with me so well. I've seen some of mine in black and white because I often, um, I often for a shadow, like particularly on some of the faces, like I will, it won't be darker at all in the shadow. It'll just be a complementary color and it will be the same tonal, tonal tone. Yeah, I know. So I There's a problem a, with that. A spot, bro. Yeah. That's why I ask you about Cause composition because it's very complex. It, it's not, I don't think it's as simple as just light and dark. No, nah, well, I mean, like the often, like the, of course, there's this, um, uh, like bridging shapes together, mm -hmm. which like you can easily do with just like softening everything as a good way to like, uh, define and undefine focus and lead the eye. Hmm. Cause you can just hop, hop over huge areas that are painted softly when you have something painted sharply right when you mentioned tying things together the artist that i interviewed that comes to mind is adam miller because when i was talking to him he he kept talking about having a structure and i didn't quite get it at first because i'm thinking light dark pattern light dark pattern light dark pattern I'm like what's his structure and then he eventually i realized that he might just make all of his figures tied together in the shape of a j or a square or a circle and he's not thinking about light and dark he's just thinking i'm knitting all these figures together around this particular shape and and that's kind yeah. of what i'm seeing on your stuff a little bit is yeah if i squint at this tree the light and dark pattern it's all grace, but yeah. it's still composed. It's well composed. It's really interesting. So yeah, so I'm glad we talked about this because this is, this is one of the uh, things I've often been confused about because so many artists think of composition differently and some are just adamant about the light and dark pattern, light and dark pattern and others like yourself, that doesn't seem to be, well, you said it, that's not the way you think. I like to like, the thing is, and again, that's the reason why I paint outside so much. Yeah. Is that I like the, I like to figure it out rather than having a predefined idea. Like if I'd designed a picture in the studio, I would never, I would never choose to paint a tree in the middle of the canvas with like a path going down each side, it looks stupid. I'd put a, trees on the side and then a curving path going in. And then a, and a man walking his dog along this path would be like the way you'd do it. But then when I painted this, I was, first it was, I had some, all this perspective and stuff. So I was like, oh, is it gonna, and it ends up just exactly in the middle. And then you have to figure out a way to. What do you mean it ends up work. in the middle? Your, your hand didn't just involuntarily paint a tree in the middle. Yeah, well, I started, well, I started going up and then I sort of thought it could, was bending over and then, just, yeah, it just ended up that way. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was conscious, like once I'd started, like right. once I'd sort of put the sketch in, I was like, okay, it's too far in the middle, I should move it over. And then it's um, maybe like, maybe I can make this work. The last time I did a painting similar, it maybe was too easy with a, a like two composition, uh, two focal points. So, so maybe it's, uh, do you think the difference is if you were in your studio and working from a photo, you would have all the time in the world. So you would take the time to do it quote unquote, right. And, and make the, that nice path, as you describe coming from the left and the tree a little off center and everything. 
but since you're out, you just have to make a decision. You have to make a decision on the fly. You did it. You went with it. You took the challenge, and now you're now you're going for it. Probably. I mean, you wouldn't try something risky in the studio. I mean, what, unless you want to just take risks. Right. But if you have all the time, why why take a risk? You may as well just <laughs> do the way that you know is going to work. Right. Unless you are risk inclined, but like as well, like the plain air paintings, well, all paintings, like, you know, if you've done five in a row that have been easy, then uh, probably not taking enough risks. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, if you get five in a row that you have to throw away, then you're going to feel pretty bad and mm -hmm. probably not want to paint anymore. So I think it's a bit about finding that balance. So earlier you mentioned that you can paint thin and then paint thick on top of it. And I think on this one, it's pretty clear that's what you're doing because it yeah. looks like you've got a green wash. In fact, you said two things earlier that you had learned from your teachers. You're doing both. You've got a green wash here and you've got a brownish wash here. And then you, quote, cut in in the sky into this green wash to create the silhouette of trees. Yeah. Yeah. Is that, am I getting that right? Is that how you approached it? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Well, it's interesting. You brought both of those two things up as the things you learned early on when you and were, also when the you were like, young. Also like it's a very complimentary colored painting as well. So I've like read it. The grays have become redder in the, and the greens have become more yellow in some places. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you more... exaggerate the perspective on this or are you literally looking up? I'm looking up. So that actually the top of the painting is where the next tree behind me meets. It actually needed a bit of behind tree you or in. behind the painting. Like no behind where I'm standing, but so like, opposite the painting you can't be serious there's a tree there's a tree going up so it meets like right on the edge of the canvas there holy moly you really looking up yeah wow so it's um it, it, but it is like that if i just measure it with my brush at the top it's like this far and then if i measure it down the bottom it's this far no kidding but do you so actually people make always say that? Why don't you, why don't you paint it with the circle? I'm like, it's, <laughs> do you actually take those measurements? Yeah. Really? And I make sure I get this. Does, it doesn't, does, I mean, it doesn't take any effort to measure. It's like an inch apart. The two, tr like the tree that's uh, in the middle from the tree that starts on the sort of far side of the canvas. You right. can see that it's like an inch from each other at the top. And then it's half a painting away on the bottom. Right, right. And then like, like once you have, once you have a few, you can inter interpolate the rest. Right. Right. Okay. I wonder, do you have any, uh, oh, you do, you have some process shots here. So I'm just going <laughs> to, I'm just going to watch this for a minute. So it, as, so the audience. I'm watching a video right now of him painting this just to get a feel for how he puts it together. And this is that painting that we just looked at. Man, it's bigger than I thought it would be. And then it the started sound raining. sound describes all of it, though. It started raining? Yeah. Yeah. It's always raining. It rains like every painting I do in Norway. Seriously. It's always raining. Man, you are hardcore. There's another artist like I you. I mean, you don't, you, don't really have another, you don't really have much of a chance if you do. You just don't go in the rain. Well, yeah, you, you could work from that. photos, you know. There's another <laughs> painter. There's a, there's quite a few that I've interviewed that are diehard plein air painters. And I just respect that immensely that you just put in the time to go out and do, and do that, even when the weather's bad. So right now I'm on Nicholas's Instagram. All the ones in that rocky location, all the ones around where you are now in time, was one trip up to like Northern Norway in October. And that was just the worst weather. So every day was just absolutely blasting with wind. So every painting, 
like even this day was a blasting day of wind, but I found when I got down <laughs> down here by the water, there was no wind. It was like in this glassy little shelter. You know, you're quite but, um, a good draftsman too. That boat would not be easy to draw, especially under the pressures ooh. of painting outside. I want to see if you would make the same foolish. What do you think the biggest challenge in this painting would be? Because I didn't foresee it. The drawing challenge? Okay, give me a second here. I'm on a floating marina, a floating dock. Well, is that part of the challenge? Are you giving me a hint? Yeah, yeah, I'm giving you a hint. Oh, well, then I would, if you're on a floating dock, then I would assume that these, the, the objects are moving away. The perspective is changing as you're kind of wobbling back and forth or side to side. Yeah, and as the tide <laughs> falls and rises. Yeah, no, that would be miserable. So you just had to lock in a perspective and kind of fake it? Well, like the thing was, I, I think in the three weeks I was up there, or four weeks, I had like three sunny days. So I sort of, I figured out on the first day, okay, I just got to lock in the perspective because everything's changing. And then I started, and then I thought, okay, lock in the boat, which really I didn't need to, because the boat, you know, it was staying with me the whole time. As the mm -hmm. tide changed. Mm -hmm. So the boat's going up but and really, the dock is staying the same level. So you, you can't even compare no, but, the heights. The boat. So painting the boat is fine. Right. Because the boat floats up and I float up. Right, but, but the dock goes down else, and up. The dock goes up and down. Yeah. So you're seeing like everything on the dock at some stages. And then at other stages, you're seeing nothing of none of those like buildings on the left there. Oh, brother. So then I had to wait. It was, then it was like raining for a few days, and then I had to wait. And, and then sun came, so I hustled back down there. And then the time of, like, the sun's just too different. The sun to tide ratio, because the tide changes slightly every day. Like, it moves an hour. So suddenly the sun wasn't, the tide wasn't, like, at this level at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, or between 1 and 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So it's like, oh, I actually need to wait. I need to work it out. I need to wait like uh, six hours. Between. I need to wait like 12 days and then hope it's sunny in 12 days and come back. Oh, my gosh. Are you freaking kidding me? When the tide me. aligns to the sun. It was, but I hadn't foreseen this. I, I'd used one of my, like I'd taken a few big canvases with me and I was like, ooh. Yeah, this is was, good oh, size. Uh, this is a good size. What would you say this is? Like 24, 36? inches oh it'll be bigger i think it's 110 centimeters which is bigger than the 40 so it'd be like 44 maybe wide mm -hmm. wow almost four feet wide jeez dude that's that's nuts yeah are you familiar with um well you might have seen the podcast beth ann moran hanslet no She's, she thing. lives in the, she lives in the Midwest where it's really cold and she only paints from life. And you see these great pictures of her outside in the snow, all bundled up in so many layers of clothes, painting in the freezing cold. And I just have so much respect for her and I'm getting the same thing for you. It's just like, dude, you're hardcore. Just, going through all that and it, it's a 44 once you get into it it's okay yeah, yeah 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 you say so yeah right i've i've done a lot of plein air painting in in my journey to learn how to be a better landscape painter but i've never taken out anything that big i think that's pretty awesome oh you just gotta not not have wind unless you have like a a, a solid a really solid setup yeah yeah and you don't like appear to have a very solid setup nah I walk and walk and bike everywhere, so I just um, have like a really lightweight one. Wow! Have you ever had a major disaster where everything just blew completely on its face? Oh yeah, that happens almost every time. You can't be serious. Like, but lots of stuff like when it dries, like even like when bugs land in it, when it's dry, you can just just wait till it's dry. So when like on my last painting, I was like biking home, and then. Every time I bike home with the painting in this big bike trailer, or like a trailer that goes on my bike, then all the mud flicks up on it because I can't, I don't really want to cover it up because it will get the 
paint that will touch the paint. Mm -hmm. So then you just have to wait till the painting's dry and then you can wipe the mud off with water. So lots of it's not, I That's feel like lots of it's tip. not as bad as you think. That's a good tip because yeah. I, I know that from hard experience. But I remember years ago, carefully trying to pick bugs out of paintings. One day it occurred to me that maybe I should just wait till it dries. And then they just brush right off. Yeah. Oh man. And you never can get them out when they're wet. You always damage the painting. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Getting like scratches with your palette knife. Uh-huh. Yeah. It's hopeless. Yeah. Okay. So this is obviously small. That's relatively large. That's probably a 36 or something. That might be like, yeah, 60 centimeters. Is it? And then again, you oh, just, maybe a bit less, 24. You've got these great stylized clouds that you don't notice right away until you just, until you really look carefully at it because it just feels like naturalism. And then you look really close and you're like, oh, wait. There's some kind of stylized yeah. clouds back there. Those clouds, that's that's one of my um, like five doodle styles. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Five. Lots of like, it'd be like, you know, if you draw around in a circle lots of times, you can sort of keep going and it makes like a cool like worm shape. Yeah. And then you can, when you change corners, it looks like you've almost drawn it like a worm. Yeah. That's those clouds. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like that. And then the way <laughs> you simplify the water is really interesting too. It's... It's just real flat right here, but it works. And and then you still manage to get the water to look very reflective. Yeah, that's that's cool. Again, look at these clouds. Dad, look at that. Can you actually see that as a has a straight up an outline around all the clouds? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Just a real yeah, hard edged yeah. outline. So what okay. So so you're just like painting this. And you paint some clouds in there and then you say to yourself, they look better with a line around them is I'm, I'm assuming that's what's going through your head. It's almost like I'd, I'd like them to be sharper. Well, on this one, it was like, uh, it's just a bit meh, the sky. Mm -hmm. So I'd like them to be sharper, but I don't, but I don't want to do them darker. Like I'd like them to be more visible, but I don't want to do them darker. I don't know if you really? know, in Photoshop, there's this thing called unsharp mask. Yeah. Yeah, so it's basically just unsharp masking the sky. No kidding. I'm glad I asked that question. So it's not just I want to make it cooler. You're after a, you're after a specific goal, and you came up with a solution to reach that goal. And it's to create contrast like without had... changing the value. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. I think that's what sets your paintings apart from a less advanced painter is, is that really you're just problem solving, taking it one painting at a time and making unique decisions to solve unique problems. I know when I started that line thing, that was after doing some woodcut prints. So oh, you're influenced by that process. Yeah. Cause it was like, it was always nice. So you could do an outline and then you could like, shaded in it felt like it stopped the you know it stopped the little uh scraping thing yeah whatever it's called chisel i don't know i don't know it stopped the scraping thing then it would fall into the little like trench at the end yeah so if you had an outline around something then you got a nice sharp edge but if you just tried to hatch then it was you kind of had to cut it was like really hard to stop stop cutting no on a kidding specific spot no kidding. I feel like you've discovered a lot about yourself today. <laughs> <laughs> this has been a fun interview. Yeah. <laughs> it's been fun to talk to you because it's, it feels like you're like, oh yeah, that's why that happened several times today. You're like a life coach. You're just like talking <laughs> me through. I mean, I'm not trying to be, my but I feel like you're, you're realizing a lot of stuff about your own work. You're undrafing me, Jeff. <laughs> I'm on draping. Exactly. Okay. Well, you know, it's been a blast talking to you though. Uh, I mean, I, as I said in the beginning, I'm an absolutely huge fan of your work. Huge fan. 
Thank you. But I got those for me. Thank you. I appreciate that. But so I got one final question and, and you have listened to the podcast. So I'm sure you know what it is. And that is what's one piece of advice that you wish you had that you could give an aspiring artist? It would be, I, but it's, it's, I'd say it would be to do what you actually think is fun because it's not a very well paid profession. Um, so if you don't like it, then like, honestly, you could just choose something, just choose something that gets paid a lot. And then you would have lots of spare time mm -hmm. to do what you want with painting. So, um, I definitely felt that when I was doing more laborious paintings that what am I even doing? I may as well just get a different job and do this in the weekends at this point. If it's going to be, uh, yeah. Yeah. Even fun. So if you want to do it, I'd say just have, make sure you have fun and then the passion I would hope and the, development would follow that i would hope. but probably not not seeing the statistics probably not probably just do something else <laughs> just your advice <laughs> is just give up just don't do it <laughs> i mean it's the same advice people told me they're like not many people are going to end up not many people at art school even are going to end up as a as an artist it's a uh, a hard profession that um i don't know i don't know what my advice is that's just like um you can talk me through it talk me through my own advice <laughs> what i'm thinking well a thought that comes to mind as you're talking i hate to give i hate to discourage anyone but one thing that i've discovered or at least i believe that i've observed over the past 20 years running an atelier is that this idea that anyone can do it is just not true. It's just not for everybody. Uh, I've, I've had so many students and some have a, some have an aptitude for it and are going to be successful and some just don't, I mean, they can learn how to paint, but they're, but it's going, they're always going to have a difficult time making a living out of it. It's just too hard. So yeah. I, I think uh, for some people that is good advice. I mean, you got to ask yourself, is this something that I have an aptitude for that with hard work, I can become great at it and, and support myself? That's what comes to mind when I but hear you, you say that. If you like it, if you're genuinely having fun, then it's not really hard work. That's the one thing I've found that, um, like, and often, like, especially after I was painting that area for three weeks, that was just the worst weather that I've been in just constantly. I didn't paint for a year after that. Are you serious? And I tried to paint a, a few times. This was only like, this was only last, this was like, what, 2022. Yeah. So I hadn't painted until now and a few months ago. So you must have another job then. How are you getting by? Yeah, I do like design stuff as well. Okay, so you're working for friends do pro projects here and there. Um, but that was the like, I just couldn't do it. I tried to do a few and it was just so boring. I just wanted to be finished as soon as I started almost. Mm -hmm. I just wasn't into it. And then I realized that it was that was really not me having fun and that nothing was working, nothing was coming out good. And then I might as well just wait until I want to do it again, which is what I did. Yeah. And then I was just off with a bang like a month ago, off with a bang. You feel the energy again. again. You feel the enthusiasm again. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's what's happened to me lately. Awesome. I've uh, been telling people for years that I don't have the energy that I used to when I was young. And maybe it's because I started exercising again since COVID. Actually, that just occurred to me. So now I'm, I'm actually making self discoveries today too. But uh, I lately I've been painting 12 hours a day, 10, 12 hours a day. And I hadn't done that for a long time. And I thought it was because I didn't have the energy for it. It's not that it's just I wasn't doing it. But yeah, and I'm almost 50. So I but what I think's happened is that I'm finding the joy again. 
and uh, I'd lost it a little bit, but I'm finding it again, and it makes you, it helps motivate you <laughs> big time. It's really hard to do it when you don't like it. Does it make better work? Do you think when you're liking it? That's yet to be determined. I, I mean, I. I I've never stopped liking it. Don't get me wrong, but there's a difference between liking it enough to do it six or eight hours a day and liking it enough to do it 10 or 12 hours a day. I mean, that's a big yeah. difference. I never stopped liking it. I've always, I, I, I would not be able to function without painting. It's, I have to do it sometimes, but I found myself for a while there, even a, as much as a decade, after about six hours looking at the clock going, I don't know how much more of this I can take. But lately I f I'm looking at the clock and going, I don't, I don't have enough time. I got to get, I, I need more time. I want to stay longer. And, uh, I don't, I'm not exactly sure what's changed, but I, but I'm with you hundred percent. It really comes down to if, if you're really into it, it's easy to put in the hours. If you're not into it, it can get kind of tough just like any other job. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. So for, yeah, for a job that statistically not many people make it, I would, that would be my advice then. Do it if you're into it. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's good advice. And you're not the first one to give it. <laughs> Peter Van Dyke <laughs> said, just get a job and paint on the side. That's what I would do. <laughs> So yeah. uh, every, in so many words, uh, you know, and for some people, that's good advice. It just depends on the person. So that's what I love about meeting all these great artists like yourself is uh, you guys have unique life experiences. And with that unique life experience, you have unique things to offer and say and unique advice to give. So thanks for coming on the show. It was great to chat with you. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's cool to finally meet you. Thanks for tuning in to the Undraped Artist Podcast. If you enjoyed it, subscribe. And if you could, leave a comment or review. That really helps the channel. Please share the show with your friends. And if you're feeling generous, consider a monthly donation at theundrapedartist.com. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you next week.